promise this is not going to be long. I won't keep you until one o'clock. How about that? <laughs> We're starting a little bit later, but the, the things that we've done this morning and the, the, the things that we've shared and prayed for are very important, and it's part of our Sunday fellowship, and it's part of our, our gathering and our worship as well. So, amen. We turn again to the Word of God this morning. Where are we going to turn? You already know it. Where are we going? Thank you. John chapter 1, the great Christmas chapter. John chapter 1. So let's turn back again there this morning um, as, we, as we conclude what we began, what I began last week as we talked about revealing, recognizing, and receiving. So we'll, we'll put up some verses in just a minute, but we turn to John 1. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter. If you, a lot of times, if you'll go back and if you'll compare John 1 with the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, you'll see that it begins in a very, very similar way. And you'll see what John writes here in chapter 1 connects throughout the New Testament, throughout the New Testament. Even, I was thinking this morning, I didn't, I didn't know that Stephen was going, to, uh, was going to include that passage from Ephesians this morning, but on my heart, I was thinking about John. And just as we read the passage from Ephesians, we saw things that fit, didn't we, with John chapter 1. We're going to look at some other, we're going to look at Hebrews this morning as well, and some others, because John talks about the main, the main thing of the gospel. And so we look this morning and we come back as we celebrate Christmas, the entrance of God the Son into our human world in John chapter 1. Last week when we looked at John 1, we looked at some of the things that the passage says, uh, say about Jesus. It's, we have in here, it says about Jesus what he is the creator that he was there in creation and that through him the world was made. Remember what it says, all things were made by him. And without him, this is the King James, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, so he is life. And that life was the light of men. That's part of it as well. He is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he is God. And he's the one and only Son. Let's look back again at John 1.14. And so this... Think about this this morning, the, one of the miracles of Christmas. He is light, He's life, He's creator, He is the Word, the expression of God, the communication of God that you and I can understand. The one and only Son, God Himself. And the Word became what? Human. He limited Himself. He chose to, to, to restrict Himself to what we are and to, to, the, to the body that we live in. And He made His home among us. We talked about this last time. He tabernacled am among us. That's the word originally in the Greek because it was just for a short time. It was not something permanent. It was something temporary. And what does it say about Him? He was full of what? Unfailing love and faithfulness. In the other translations, full of what? Grace and truth. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, Emmanuel, God with us. He made His home with us, and it is God with us. And then in John 1, 17 and 18, for the Jewish audience, they would certainly understand the first part of this. The law was given through Moses, but God's love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. And sometimes we look at, when we read about the law in the New Testament, and I think sometimes as Christians and as New, Trest New Testament Christians, and especially for us as non-Jews, I think, I don't know that there's any ethnically Jewish person in here. Maybe some of us are some little part or something like that. But we often look at when, when it talks about the law, especially in the New Testament, and we think that has nothing to do with me. That's only for Jews. That has nothing to do with me. But I think it does have something to do with us because the law points to us and reminds us that our good will never be good enough. Our efforts will never get us to where we know we need to be. That we will try our best and do our best, but we will fall short. And that's, the Bible's very clear. That was one of the things that the law showed the people and pointed out to the people. That 
you couldn't make it. You could try to keep the law, but you'd never be able to. And people didn't really understand that at times because that was a, that was a, it wasn't a complete understanding at that time. And they didn't understand that the law was pointing to Jesus one day, that in the flesh, Jesus in the flesh, which is one of the reasons he came, many more, but that's one of the reasons he came, he would keep the law. And he would keep the law not to show us, see, if you're really, really good, you can keep the law. That's not why Jesus kept the law fully. But in him, Jesus kept the law fully and met the requirements in himself, in his body, so that, not so that we can look at Jesus and say, well, Jesus can because he's God's son. No, that's not why. But so that we can receive from Jesus, the righteousness that is ours through faith. He kept the law, and you and I are found in Jesus, and we are in Him. So to me, when I read about the law in the New Testament, I pay attention to it. That, that points to me. That has something to say to me. And the law is a reminder to me and to you. I cannot make it by my own good efforts, but I don't have to because Jesus did. And he was full of grace and truth. And remember what it says in John 1, 16? From his abundance, remember that we talked about this last time, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Remember the translation. One of the translations is what? Grace upon grace. Grace upon upon grace, like the waves of the ocean that break on the shore, wave after wave after wave. Have you experienced grace upon grace in your life? I have. If I only received one-time grace, I wouldn't be here this morning. I wouldn't make it. But thank God, He knows what is needed in my life. And so He has given me Jesus, full of grace and truth. And from His fullness and His abundance, I have received, and you have received, grace upon grace. I want to stress something else this morning as we consider that. Last week when we talked about this, I said something like, it, it, we need grace in our time not just in our, our weaknesses or when we fail, and that's when we can approach the throne of God boldly, as we read in Hebrews 4, but even just as Christians, as we walk day by day, we must have the grace upon grace of God to walk with the Lord and to walk in His ways and to overcome flesh and to, to shine His light and to be what God has called us to be. It requires the grace upon grace that comes from the fullness that is found in Jesus. And we go back to verse, go back again to verses 17 and 18, John chapter 1. We didn't read verse 18 this time, but look at it again. John writes, John the Beloved writes, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son is Himself God and is near to the Father's heart. He has what? Revealed, Revealed God to us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus answers the questions that men and women have had through the ages until now. What is God like? Can He love me? Is He a hard God? Does He care about me? Does He know what's going on in my life? What is God like? And Jesus answers that question when He comes. And when He came, He answered the question, what God is like. He has revealed God to us. And He made His home with us so that we might receive grace upon grace. He made His home with us where we were and where we are. That we might know that God is full of love and full of faithfulness towards us as we are, just as our lives are just as dirty, smelly, and cold, and messy as the manger to which Jesus came. And that's where He came. And He comes into our lives in the same way. And He has revealed God to us. That's why He came in the flesh. He's the Word, God's expression to us. John 1 and 1 and 2. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. And that tells us something else this morning. God is not silent. 
He's not a silent God. He's not way off far somewhere. Do you know what some people think about God and what they say about God? They will sort of accept, yes, there is a God, and maybe He made the world and He made the universe, but what He did after He made it was He, in effect, He just sort of said, boom, here you go, okay, live your life, now you're on your own. But John tells us when we read these verses that that's not what God is like. He is not a silent God. He's a communicating God. He's a speaking God to you where you are, your language, in words you can understand, in expressions that you can understand. Sometimes I talk with people, and I know sometimes even if people don't say it, I know what people feel because I have felt it before at times. And I have felt like nobody really understands me. Have you ever felt that? Nobody really understands me. Have you ever felt nobody really understands what I am going through? Have you ever felt that? Let these words speak to you this morning. God understands because He came in the flesh. And He understands you. And He speaks your language. And He understands and He knows what you're going through. And He cares. This is what John chapter 1 tells us. Now, turn with me to Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. And you think, well, I thought we're talking about John, the great Christmas chapter. We are. But I want you to see the best interpreter of Scripture is other Scripture. When you read something here, because the author, there were men who wrote the words down, but the author is God the Holy Spirit who inspired it. And look with me at Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, and then think about John chapter 1. Listen to what the writer to Hebrews says. We don't know who he is. Some people declare he is Paul, but we don't know. Some people say, no, 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 it was, uh, it was Apollos. Some even say, no, it was Priscilla. We don't know. But all we do know that it is that it came from God, and these are the words of God. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, what? Say that, read that phrase with me. He has spoken to us through His Son. That's how God has spoken to us. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. And I go, oh yeah, that's right. That's what it says in John chapter 1 as well, isn't it? That the world was made by Him. Verse 3, the sun radiates God's own glory. And what does it say? Read this phrase together. And expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his hand. And, and, and so on. So we read that, the very character of God. What is God like? Remember what I told you last week? People have said this to you before, haven't they? I like, I don't, I like, Jesus is okay, but I don't like God. Right? God's so hard. He's so this, he's so that. When Jesus came in the flesh and walked the earth, what did he do? He expressed the very character of God, full of grace and truth, full of unfailing love and faithfulness. That's God. That's God. It's not, oh, I can talk to Jesus, or oh, I can talk to Mary because Jesus is softer and kinder, or I can talk to Mary because she can talk to Jesus and Jesus can talk to God. This is the expression, Jesus was the expression of God. All that you see in Him, that is God. That is God. And there will not be another or a different expression or manifestation of God to mankind. Those of us right now that do things in China, uh, and some of you that are involved in China, know that there is at present a cult that's growing in China. And it's called the uh, Eastern Lightning Cult. It's actually here in Hong Kong as well. I think the God's mighty church or the mighty glorious church of God or something like that. It's now, they have a church, at least one church here in Hong Kong as well. And their claim is that Jesus has come again and he has come as a Chinese and as a woman this time. Uh, and, uh, and she is the Messiah now. At Jesus, yes, Jesus was an expression of God and there were other things, but now Lightning Dung is her name. Uh, is, is that, that's the English translation for it, Lightning Dung. And she is the new, she is the new manifestation. She's the new Messiah. That's a lie. That if you've not, if, if you're saying, well, what about that? It's a lie. Why? Because the Bible tells us, and in these final days, 
he has spoken to us through his son. There will not be another revelation. And the context and the meaning here is that Jesus is the final word. Jesus, that, that's what this means here. He is God's final expression to us. Yes, he speaks to us where we are this day, th this day and where we are, but it is through Jesus and through the work of Jesus there will not be another manifestation. If somebody comes along and claims to you, which is one of the things that Mormons have done as well, oh, we have another revelation. Joseph Smith got more and Brigham Young got more or whatever. That's not what God's word says. He has spoken to us through his son. And brothers and sisters, you and I need to listen to Jesus. We need to listen to Jesus. When the Holy Spirit works and when the Holy Spirit is at, at um, moving in our midst, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the Holy Spirit lifts up Jesus. God the, Holy, God the Holy Spirit, who is equally God with God the Father and God the Son. He's going to lift up, He's going to glorify Jesus. Jesus. He's going to reveal Jesus to us. God has chosen to sp speak to us through His Son. Clearly, perfectly, completely, the character of God and the voice of God. Now, this is wonderful. Jesus has revealed God, but we can't stop there. There's more to it as well. And John the Beloved, not John the Baptist, sometimes we read it and we get a little bit mixed up, don't we? We say, now, because this talks about John the Baptist. So was this John the Baptist writing this part? Um, we'll go back to John chapter 1. Let's look at John 1, 6 through 9 and 15. No, it's John the Beloved, who was one of the disciples, speaking about John the Baptist, who was a relative of Jesus. And their roles and their missions and their characters and their personalities were very, very different. And John the Beloved, who also wrote, what else? You know, I always ask things, right? What else did John the Beloved write in the New Testament? What, 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 what? Revelation, the book of Revelation, and what else? First, second, third John, okay? First, second, third John as well. And also the Gospel of John. And John writes about the other John. And here's what we read. God sent a man, John the Baptist, this is the relative of Jesus, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Then we go down a little bit further, John verse 15. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about! When I said, someone is coming after me. Imagine that. Here's John the Baptist, rough, rugged, wearing who knows what. And he shouts and he says, look, there's Jesus. And his, his mission was to point people to Jesus. He wanted people what? We talked about revealing because Jesus came to re reveal God. And John the Baptist was sent that we might recognize, that people might recognize this is God's Son, God's one and only Son. He has come to save people from their sins. When God spoke in and through Jesus, He didn't want anyone to miss who Jesus was and why He had come. The light, the true light, life, the only hope to escape death, truth, the only truth that would lead people to God, the only means possible through which you and I might have a relationship with God, the very reason for our being. That's the reason for our being, that we might have a relationship with God. And John the Baptist came so that people would recognize this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. But John records a tragic truth. John 1, 10 and 11. What do we read here? He came into the very world He created, but the world didn't what? <laughs> didn't recognize Him. And He came to His own people, and even they rejected Him. I want to ask you something this morning. Why do you think they did not recognize Jesus? Think about that for just a minute. Why didn't they recognize Jesus? He wasn't what they were expecting, right? He wasn't what they were expecting. He didn't fit their idea of what the one sent from God, their Messiah, would be like. 
They were looking for a king and not a servant. They were looking for an educated man, not someone from the rough speaking and common region of Galilee. They were looking for an upper class elite, not a poor carpenter's son. <coughs> they weren't looking for someone born in a manger. Who are they looking for? Someone born in a palace, in a palace. And so they didn't recognize him. And he said the things that they didn't think the Messiah would say. We look at this and we look at the Jews and we <laughs> shake our heads in disbelief and we think, how could they not recognize Jesus? But I want to challenge you this morning because I believe that people today and sometimes we, we still don't recognize Jesus either, do we? We get in tough situations. We face difficult people. There are things going on in our lives. And if you and I are honest, we would acknowledge and admit, sometimes Jesus is at work in my life and I don't recognize him. I think it's the devil. You know what I mean? Things are going on. It's the devil. Lord, deliver me from this. And it is God working in us to try to work some things out of us. Have we not ourselves not understood or seen that there were times when God was at work in our hearts and in our lives and trying to work through difficult people and through difficult situations? But we want God to fit our image. We want God to fit our expectations. We want God to do things the way we want Him to do it, right? Have you ever said, God, answer my prayer and answer it just this way? And when God doesn't answer it just this way, we get all upset, don't we? We think, well, that's not God. Well, I don't like this at all. God, where are you? And God says, I am right here, and I'm right in your midst, and I'm trying to do something. And yet, we don't recognize Him either. True or not true? <laughs> Very and the rest of you that didn't say anything, it's true. It's true. There are times when we don't recognize either. But there's more than recognizing as well. I told you I was going to keep it short this morning. Reveal, number one, Jesus came to reveal God. He came to His own, and He's come to us. And sometimes we don't recognize. But there's a third part, and that's receive. What will you do about Jesus? What will we do about Jesus? John tells us what most people did when Jesus came. John 1 11. What does it say? He came into the world He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. And then verse 11, read it with me. He came to His own people and even they rejected Him. Or other translations say, even they did not receive Him. I want us to read it this morning in the Amplified as well. It really expresses, it gives us a, an even fuller picture of verse 10 and 11. And, and think about this just a minute. He came into the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. It did not know Him. He came to that which belonged to Him, to His own, His domain, His creation, His things, the world. And they who were His own did not receive Him and did not welcome Him. The majority did not receive Him when He came. And you know what? Jesus knew before He came that that would be the case. Jesus knew the world is not going to recognize me. Jesus knew the world, by and large, is not going to receive me. And Jesus said, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in complete agreement. But I am coming anyhow. Because if I don't, people will be lost. There will be no hope. You wouldn't be sitting here this morning if Jesus hadn't come. I wouldn't be. And Jesus knew, Jesus knew, most will reject me, most will not receive me, but Nomer is going to hear 
and recognize and receive. Anne Klein is going to hear and recognize and receive. And so is Chris. And so is Brother Roy. And so is Sister Bridget. And so is Polly Ann. And so are all of us here this morning who have recognized and received. And if Jesus hadn't come, oh, we'd be lost. No hope, no chance. And so Jesus said, I'm coming, I'm coming. This is my world. And I choose to limit myself and be bound by what I have created. I talk with people sometimes, and you do as well, who really, really almost <laughs> hate God. Have you ever talked with somebody who almost hates God? They, they, they say, who is God to tell me what to do? Has anybody ever said that to you before? They've said it to me. Who is God to tell me how to live? Who is God to say what I can or cannot do? This is my life. It's my choice. I can do what I want to do. Who does God think he is? Oh, he's so arrogant. He's so proud. He's this and he's that. And when we look at this, it's not God who is arrogant and proud, is it? It is mankind. It is creation that God has made. We are the ones that are arrogant. We are the ones that are proud to say, who does God think He is? He's the one who's made us. He's the one who's created us. He came to what was His. He came to what should reflect and reveal His glory. And instead, oh, it's so twisted and so messed up. But still, Jesus came. Why? For God so loved the whole world that He gave His one and only Son so that we should not perish but have life. Let's look at the NIV of John 3, 16 and 17. We've been looking at mostly New Living Translation and Amplified. Let's look at the <coughs> NIV. Shall we read it together and think about it? Why Jesus came and why we receive Him. Let's read together. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. The message of God is not a message of condemnation, and it is not a message of judgment. Our sins have judged us. Without God and without Jesus, we're, we're doomed. We're doomed. So the next time somebody says to you or argues with you, God is so hard, turn to John 3, 16 and 17. He sent Jesus. He spoke Jesus. He spoke our language that He might be revealed in all of His love and His faithfulness and His truth. And we need, the we need all of His love and we need all of His truth as well. And He sent Jesus not to condemn, but that we might have life. And John 1.12 says, But to all who believed Him, and accepted Him, or received Him, He gave the right to become children of God. So this morning, as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus into the world, let the Holy Spirit speak these three <coughs> truths to you again. Jesus came to reveal God. Do you understand God or do you have a, a, a warped idea of Him? God's kind of hard. Oh, come on. You know, we do think that sometimes, don't we? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Full of grace and truth. Wave upon wave of gracious blessing. May we recognize Him in our lives and in our situations. And may we receive, receive and say, yes, God, you are the Lord of my life. 
Stephen, would you come and lead us this morning? Um, the, the song that we didn't sing at the beginning, um, what can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my life to you? That's one of the ways we receive, by offering back to Him because He has given us of Himself. Um, backup singers, if you just come back up again. This is... Uh, Andreas, go ahead and put the words up. Uh, what can I do but thank you? Yeah. Shall we, shall we stand this morning? Just respond to the Lord this morning. You want to just close your eyes and come along and sing as you will.
Jesus, we thank you for coming and revealing God to us. And we want to do more than just say, wow, that's great. Lord, we recognize you. We do in our midst, in our lives. You are here. You are Emmanuel, God with us, not far away and not far off. And Lord, this morning, we receive you again yes, into our lives. Lord, we open our hearts to you. Lord, some of us this morning would say, Oh, Jesus, my heart is like that manger. It's, it's really dark and it's messy and, and I don't really want you to see it. But you have said that you came to be Emmanuel, God with us. So I open my heart to you this morning. Yes. Open my life again to you this morning. Amen. Come in and shine your light. Come in and take what is broken and dirty and not holy and make it holy because that's why you came. You didn't come looking for a palace. You didn't come looking for a life that's really great and that has it all together. But you came for us broken. You came for us messed up. You came for us involved in things that we really shouldn't be involved in to bring life and light and hope and truth and holiness. Come in again, we pray, this Christmas. And Lord, may we in return, what can we do but thank you and praise you and give our lives to you as you have given yourself to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.